All right, we are in Revelation chapter 2 this morning. Why don't you open your Bibles there, Revelation chapter 2. And we've been doing a study through the book of Revelation. And uh, what is this, the fourth study? And we're actually going to get into chapter 2. That's pretty cool, yeah. <laughs> but we still have to start in chapter 1. <laughs> Why don't you all stand? Let's, uh, we're going to start reading in oh, verse 17. And uh, then we'll take it down to verse 11 of chapter 2. We'll see if we get there. Verse 17 of chapter 1, it says, And when I saw him, and that's speaking about John seeing Jesus, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And to the, uh, the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, and you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Let's stop right there and let's pray. And Father, again, we just want to come before you and thank you, Lord, for the time that we get to spend in your word, especially in this book. You made a promise that uh, if we read these words and we listen to the words of this prophecy, that you're going to give us a blessing. And Lord, again, we come before you asking that you would do exactly that and that you would bless the time uh, that we spend in your word. Um, speak to our hearts, Lord. We pray for those who may be here this morning that don't know you yet. Um, we pray that you would just show them how good you are, how much you love them, and Lord, that they would come to know you. And we ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. Um, we're starting in on the um, second major division of the book of Revelation, and that's the letters to the churches. And you have those in chapters three and four. You'll remember that in chapter one, over in verse 11, Jesus said to John um, in verse 11, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And Asia in our context would be Turkey. It was a Roman province and they called it the province of Asia, but um, in modern times it's called Turkey. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So there's these seven churches in Turkey that were existing at the time that Jesus sent the book of Revelation to. He uh, gave it to John and specifically sent it to these churches. So as we're going through chapter th uh, two and three, um, what you're going to see is Jesus' letter to each one of these churches. Um, it starts with Ephesus. That's a real famous church. In fact, the book of Ephesians is written to the church at Ephesus. Paul had some dealings with the church of Ephesus. He spent a, a large amount of time there. Um, um, he had some good friends there, a bunch of elders that were in that place. And one of the last things that, uh, one of the last churches that he dealt with before he went to prison to Rome was at the church of Ephesus. And we'll be 
reading some passages out of Acts chapter 20 that uh, deal with that whole thing. Basically, these churches that, that, John, uh, that John is writing to, that Jesus is sending this letter to, are in a circular pattern. And so you got the, I, I should have put a graphic up for you, I'll do it next week. But you got the, the uh, country of Turkey kind of sticks out in the Aegean Sea. Um, so here's Turkey. Down here is Patmos, the island that um, John is writing from. And he starts with Ephesus, which was a coastal city at the time. And Ephesus is right on the coast. And then it jo goes, in this, goes in this circular pattern all the way around to the seven churches. And um, again, the first one that's here is Ephesus. The book of Revelation has the keys to interpretation in it. And one of the, one of the key passages that outlines the book of Revelation is in chapter one. In verse 19, Jesus says, write the things which you have seen. Okay, so we're in verse 19. What are the things that, Jesus, or that um, John has seen up until this point? And what he's seen up until this point is this revelation of Jesus, this vision of Jesus, where he's standing in the midst of seven golden lampstands, and he has seven stars in his hands, and his eyes are like a flame of fire, and his hair is white as wool, and he's got a golden uh, girdle around his chest and a, a white garment, and that whole thing. It's this vision of Christ that he's seen that literally knocked him to his, knocked him to his knees. He fell down flat because he was so terrified. And so it's a picture of Christ and his glory, but specifically of Christ coming in judgment. He's coming in judgment in the book of Revelation. And we've talked about this a couple of different times, and so I'm not going to beat that one to death. But in the book of Revelation, you have Jesus coming to stop it. He's going to stop it all. So all the stuff that the world's been doing, all the stuff that everybody's been griping uh, at God about for thousands of years, he's going to finally stop it. And, um, you know, one of the th those things that, people have against God is that if God is so good, then why does he put up with evil? And the Bible's really clear on what the answer to that is. God delays his coming in which he's going to judge evil. Jesus delays his coming in which he's going to judge evil because he's not willing that any should perish. And so there's a lot of stuff that God puts up with because um, he loves not only the people who may be getting persecuted or hassled or the wrong is being done to them. He loves not only them, but he loves the persecutors too. And what he's doing is he's giving them an opportunity to repent. And the book of Revelation, as we go through it, it's the last opportunity. It's the last opportunity. And God gets pretty gnarly in the book of Revelation. And so that's what you see with Jesus. You see that vision of Christ coming in judgment. So that's the things that John has seen up to this point. And then he says, and the things which are, and the things which are. And we don't know exactly what that is at this point, um, but it's something that is going on right now in the context of what uh, John is dealing with. And then Jesus says, and the things which will take place after this. And literally in Greek, it's metatata, after these things, metatata. Okay, so it's the things that you've seen. And at, at that point, it's the vision of Jesus, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. Well, that phrase right there kind of helps you out because there is a passage in the book of Revelation where Jesus uses specifically that term, metatata, after these things. And if you'll turn over to the book of Revelation in chapter four, look at verse one. And it says, after these things, metatata. And so what Jesus does is he outlines the book of Revelation. So what you have then is if after these things begins in chapter four, then the things which are would be in chapters two and three. So the vision of Jesus, the things which are, the things which will take place after these things. And that's one of the reasons that I hold to a futuristic position on the book of Revelation. The things that are going to be taking place after the things that are, are the things in Revelation ch chapter four, all the way through the end of the book. What you have in chapter two and three are the things of the church, seven letters to seven churches. Now, when you, when you look at the um, seven letters to the seven churches, one of the things that, again, I want to emphasize is that these are literal churches in the first century. The book of Revelation was written about 90 AD, somewhere in between 90 and 95 AD. It was at the end of John's life. And so this is about 60 years after the death of Christ. 
that these things are taking place. These things are being written to the churches, okay? So the church as a whole is 60 years old at this point, and these are seven literal churches in Turkey at the time. They existed at that time, right? And so these, are go these, these letters are going to apply to situations that were taking place in the first century. And we haven't gone through and read them all. Um, hopefully um, you're reading ahead, but you'll find that as we're going through these letters, there's some pretty whacked out churches in the first century. So you got churches that are literally allowing idol worship in their fellowship. You got churches that are literally allowing adultery and sexual immorality to take place in their fellowship. You have churches that literally have thrown Jesus out of the fellowship. The very last church, Jesus is knocking on the door to the church asking if he could come inside. And so that's all in the first century. That's important to realize about church history. In the first century, in the 90s, Jesus is knocking on the door to the church saying, can I please come in? And the reason that I'm emphasizing that is because a lot of times well, when, when you start getting into, you know, the first thing that happens when you become a Christian is you start getting into the Bible and you start learning about these things. And then at some point you, you start um, getting into church history. And one of the things that I always thought was that the church in the first century was awesome and always did it right and always squared away and stuff like that. And in the second century, these guys were kind of squared away and had all these things that I've got, actually got some of the writings. Actually, I've got all the writings of the church in the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth centuries. And so um, you sit there and you, you look at those things and, and a lot of times people will take their doctrinal positions from churches that um, are around in the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth centuries. And the problem is in the first century, these guys are out of whack already. They're already messed up. And so I always take um, a church history and the, what, what are called the church fathers with a grain of salt. They're just like anybody else. They're just like any other pastor. And we've got churches around nowadays that are squared away, love the Lord, follow the word, really, really cool. And then we got other churches that are all into themselves and think that they're rich and think that they're awesome and uh, think that they're all squared away and Jesus isn't even in, the, in, their, in their church. And then you got other churches that are under persecution and you have, have that whole thing going on. It's just a kind of panoply of what the church looks like. And it was happening in the first century also. Here's another thing. Even before 90 AD, there's real problems in churches in the first century. That's why all the letters were written to the churches. And so as you go through the book of Romans, there are issues that Paul is dealing with when he's writing to Rome. There are issues that he's dealing with uh, uh, to the church at Ephesus, the church at Colossae. These guys are getting whacked out. They're believing all kinds of false doctrine. Galatians, the, the church in Galatia, which is another area in Turkey, same thing. All kinds of whacked out stuff is going on and Paul is having to deal with these guys. So you gotta keep that in mind when, when you're talking about uh, what's happening. And so when somebody comes up to me and says, I don't know, Hippolytus said this about church doctrine, and so I kind of believe Hippolytus. You guys know, all, you all know Hippolytus, right? Yeah, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> I'm a weirdo. <laughs> um, when, Hippol when somebody says Hippolytus believes all these things, I go, well, you know, Hippolytus lived in the, you know, in the second, third century. There's all kinds of whacked out stuff going on in the second, third century. Just because Hippolytus said it doesn't mean it's okay. Does the Bible say it? And that's what you always go to. You always go to what scripture says. If the church fathers go along with scripture, great. And if they don't, then they're out of whack, just like anybody else, right? Okay, so you had literal churches that were around in the 90s AD, and you had real problems that were going on. The second thing that you have, and you'll notice it as we go through each one of these letters, is that the letters are addressed to everyone who has an ear to hear. Everyone who has an ear to hear. Okay, feel up on the side of your head. You have ears? Obviously, it's written to you too. And so it's not just confined to the church in the first century. Um, here's, here's another thing that's um, kind of interesting is that if you go through and you look at the situations that were taking place in each one of these churches in the order that they're addressed, it coincides with church history, Western church history, not Eastern church history, but Western church history. So the, the, the church in Europe 
um, it coincides with um, what was going on in church history. And so you have the very first church that we read about would be the apostolic church where doctrine was a big issue. They were watching out for false teaching, that kind of stuff. They, they were holding up the word of God and they were a trusted church by Jesus, but they began to leave their, uh, uh, excuse me, they began to leave their first love. And then after that, you have Pergamos, or excuse me, Smyrna, and that's the church that was under persecution. And in church history, you have this, this outpouring of the spirit on the church, this interest in the word of God, this desire to follow Christ to, you know, to the end, just faithfulness there. And then you have persecution because of that faithfulness. And then after that, you have compromise. And Pergamos or Pergamum is the church that's compromising. And then after that, you have idolatry inside the church. And then after that, you have a church that says that they're alive and yet they're dead. And you go down through, through we'll do that as we're going through and looking at, at these different letters, but you can see an outline of church history for the last 2,000 years, which is kind of interesting because those are the things that are. We are in what's called the church age. We are in that period of time where the Holy Spirit is at work in the, um, in the world, bringing people into the church. And so those would be the things that are. And finally, it's a description of churches that are in existence now. So we can go through and look at each one of these churches and see issues that are taking place in different churches in um, the world right now. Those things are taking place. And so again, there's a call to hear. Um, when, I, when I said, um, when I talked about the fact that um, they're written to he who has an ear, in every one of these um, uh, letters, you have this exhortation, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Okay, that is also an indication that each one of these churches um, is going to address situations that may be going on in your life individually. And so you have an individual application, you have a church-wide application, you have a historical application, and all those things are wrapped up in chapters two and three of the book of Revelation. So when we get into it, it's cool stuff because what you find out is exactly what Jesus thinks about church. What does Jesus think about church? There's all kinds of things that churches do that Jesus addresses and he'll let you know where, whether he thinks it's okay or whether it's not okay. He's going to tell you exactly what he thinks of church. Don't you love that? I think that's pretty cool. Lots of people have opinion about church. They've all, you know, lots of people have all kinds of opinions about church and how church should go. I have opinions about how church should go. You have opinions about how church should go. People in the world have opinions about how church should go. Um, whose opinion do you think should be the most important? Yeah, it's Jesus's opinion about her, how church should go. So as we're going through and looking at these things, pay attention to all that stuff because again, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very cool thing. Now, one of the things that you have in verse 20 here is, um, again, Jesus says, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. I'm not gonna go back through the vision, but Jesus was standing in the midst of seven golden lampstands and he has seven stars in his right hand. And he lets you know that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And you see that again in verse one, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And again, he's already told you what that represents. The seven stars are the angels, the seven lampstands are the churches. Um, you know what, you guys know what a lampstand is, right? Um, we have lamps nowadays, and a lot of times we'll take lamps and we'll stick them on coffee tables and that kind of thing. But a lampstand was something that was basically a stand that you put a candle on the top of. And the reason that you did that is because if you can get the light higher, people can see better. And he says that the lampstands are the seven churches. What is the light? A lampstand is not a light. A lampstand is a, is a lampstand. What is the light? 
and Jesus is the light of the world. The church is the light of the world too. You are the light of the world, but Jesus is the light of the world. And what we're supposed to be doing as churches are taking Christ, lifting him up so that people can see him. That's the point of church. And if there is no lamp on the lampstand, then the lampstand isn't doing its job, right? And so the primary job of the church is to magnify and glorify Jesus. It's what's supposed to be happening. And that's why in the last letter, the letter to the Laodiceans, when Jesus says, I'm not even in your building with you, that's why it's so pitiful because all you got left there is the lampstand and you don't have the light at all. And so there's churches where you have that. We're the messengers. And we've talked about this before, so I'm not gonna beat that up. But the word messenger in Greek is angelos. And it's a term that most often means angels. It's, it's literally taken straight out of Greek, brought into English. Angelos becomes angels in English. But the term itself just means messenger. And so the term angelos is used of John the Baptist. He's called the messenger of God. It's used of John the Baptist's disciples. Um, there were messengers sent from uh, John the Baptist to Jesus in Mark chapter one. And it's used of the disciples of Jesus. He sent them as messengers to Samaria. And in each, each one of those uh, situations, it's the word angelos that's translated into English messenger. So if you're reading Greek and you come up on the word angelos, you don't automatically go angel. If you're reading Greek, when you come up on the word angelos, you go, oh, it means messenger. Let's see, let's see what kind of messenger this is. Is this an angel, a messenger from heaven? Or is this a messenger in another context? And so you gotta keep that in mind. So when he says to the angel or to the messenger of the church of Ephesus write, he's either talking about an angel from heaven or he's talking about some other kind of messenger, right? And since he's going through and rebuking most of these churches, there's only two churches that don't get a rebuke. Since he's going through and rebuking most of these churches, there's a good chance that he's not talking about a messenger from heaven at that point. So who would he be talking about? And what he'd be, what he'd be, who'd he be talking to is the messenger of the church at Ephesus, which would be the pastor at that point. Got it? Is that good? Okay. So to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. What are the seven stars again? Yeah, the seven, the, the seven messengers or the seven angels of the churches. So to the angel or to the messenger of the church at Ephesus, um, write, these things says he who is holding you in his hand. And that's a, that's a great picture. The pastor of a church is supposed to be held in the hand of Jesus. And that's one of those things that I've experienced all the way through my walk with Christ, obviously, especially as, um, as I've been a pastor. God watches out for me. He holds me in his right hand and he takes care of me. I rarely, you know, actually, I stopped defending myself a long time ago um, when I first became a Christian. And God does a really good job of defending me. He watches out for me. And that's a, that's a cool thing. He doesn't only watch out for me, he watches out for you too. The Bible talks about the angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear him. That's in Psalm 91. And so you can know that God not only holds me in his right hand, he's holding you in his right hand too, and he's watching out for you too. And the reason I'm saying that to you is because most of the conflicts that churches get into or that people in church get into all have to do with defending yourself. Somebody says something, somebody does something and you feel like you've been slighted or wronged and that kind of thing. And so you have to go out and defend yourself. No, you don't. No, you don't. God can define, defend you right well. He can take care of you. And so um, that whole self-defense thing where you're going back at people and getting on them and, and that kind of thing, you don't have to do it anymore. You can trust that Jesus is going to do it for you. And that's a cool thing. The other thing that is... Um, uh, something that's implied by that whole situation is it's great when Jesus is holding you in his right hand when everything's going well. What about when things are not going well? And what I'm talking about is not going well, uh, not, 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 not going well, double negative. 
<laughs> just in, uh, in, the, in the situation around you, but not going well in your own life. If God's holding you in his right hand and he's looking at you and he's going, not good, and you're in his right hand, there's some implications there. You better watch out. And so, again, what Jesus is doing is talking to these different churches, and if he's talking to the pastors of the churches, he's going, I'm holding you in my, holding you in my right hand, buddy. So on the one hand, that's really comforting. On the other hand, it's like, oh, better watch out here. And so that's, that's a cool thing, too. These things says, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And I love that, too because that's one of those uh, passages that talks about the fact that Jesus is in our midst. He walks up, up and down in the midst of the church. And I talked about this um, a couple of weeks ago, actually, you know, probably about a month ago now, when we were doing the vision of Jesus walking up and down in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. But you know what? One of the things that happens that just, is just really wild about Christians getting together is that when we get together as a body, Jesus is there in the midst. And he just does all kinds of cool things. I can tell you story after story after story about me standing up here and I'm just doing my Bible study and, you know, and, and things are, you know, I'm just doing my Bible study. It's all I'm doing. I'm looking up and people are sitting there weeping. And I'm like, and I'll look around and I'll, I'll be, I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll lock on somebody and they're just sitting there crying. And I'm like, good grief, what's going on? All I'm doing is teaching my Bible study. What's happening? And they'll come up and talk to me afterwards and say, you said this and you said this and God just started speaking to my heart and, you know, I've been going through this thing forever and all this stuff. And you know what that, that's attributed to? My great Bible study. <laughs> or the fact that Jesus is walking up and down in the midst of the church. Right? You know what I mean? There's all, been all kinds of times that I've been going to church or you know, listening, listening to somebody or even listening to somebody on the radio, even listening to myself on the radio. This one time I'm coming down from, from Spokane and they, uh, they had me on the, on the radio up there. I'm coming down from Spokane and you know, I, I'm, I'm like anybody else, I can't stand my voice. You, you ever heard your voice recorded? Yeah, that's, you know, it's like, turn a guy off. But, you know, I'll sit there, I'll, I was sitting there listening to it because I want to hear the intro and, I, you know, and I was going to listen to the outro and all that stuff, see how it was going and that kind of thing. And I turned the thing on and I'm sitting there listening to the, to the study and I can't remember what it was about, but it was really convicting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there listening to it and I'm like, whoa, that's a really good point. And it's me. <laughs> you know, what is that? You know, I didn't know I knew that. You know, it was, one of those kinds of things. And it's because what Jesus does is he uses his word and he doesn't care who's speaking it. He doesn't care. He uses his word. He speaks to people's hearts and he's walking up and again, up and down in the midst of the church and he's ministering to people. And so things, things that get said will just take you off uh, a, a lot of times on a tangent. I've been in Bible studies. Actually, I remember one Bible study where Greg Laurie was speaking. I, was at, uh, I uh, went to Greg Laurie's church when I was younger, and he's speaking, and he's going through this passage in Samuel, and um, it's, a, it's a passage where David had wanted to build the temple, and God told him no, and what God told him was, I want to build a house for you. I never asked you to build a house for me. I want to build a house for you, and as soon as he said that, God just takes me off on this tangent and starts telling me about all these things that he wants to do for me. It was, it was one of the most radical things that I've ever gone through when I've been sitting in a church service and God was just laying out all this stuff for me and I'm like, whoa, and I'm not even listening to the study anymore. Just because of one thing that the guy said, boom, God takes off on it. Because Jesus walks up and down in the midst of the church and he's walking up and down in the midst of the church right now, ministering to every single one of us. And he'll come along and he'll touch your heart and he'll show you how much he loves you. Sometimes he'll come along and he'll convict you and he'll say, this is out of line. This is not what I called you to. This is not where we started and this is not where we're going to end. This needs to stop. And sometimes he'll be speaking to you about your children. Sometimes he'll speak, be speaking to you about your parents. God did that all the time with me about how to reach my parents, how to, how to minister to people who are around me. And he's doing all this stuff because Jesus walks up and down in the midst of the church. It's why you don't want to miss church. People take and separate themselves from the fellowship of believers. And what Jesus promised was that he was going to be there when we were all gathered together. You don't miss that. 
If you miss it, you're missing out on a blessing. And it's one of those things that, again, I learned pretty early on. I can read my Bible all by myself. And I got all the books you, can, you, you could ever read sitting in my library. And I don't, I don't need to have fellowship with other people to be able to understand the Word of God and that kind of thing. That's not why I come to church. And when I, you know, when I went over to, uh, I just got back from vacation. Um, I was over uh, visiting Bobby's relatives. That's where we always go on vacation. <laughs> visiting Bobby's relatives. Just watch it. She's not here. Don't tell her. <laughs> yeah, in Hawaii. <laughs> They happen to live on Kauai. Uh, in any case, we're, um, we're visiting our relatives and I'm going to church. And I'm not going to church so that I can listen to the pastor who's my brother-in-law who doesn't know as much as I do. <laughs> I'm just messing around. <laughs> He's a great guy. Um, but I'm s sitting there listening to my brother-in-law teach and I'm not sitting there expecting gr brand new revelations from Bruce Baumgartner. That's not why I went to church. The reason I went to church is because I like to hear basic stuff. I like to hear what the word of God has to say. But even more than that, I know that Jesus is going to meet me in a special way every time that I go. That's exactly what he does. I don't go to church because I'm learning new things. Obviously, I'm, here, I'm sitting here teaching. I'm not coming here to learn new things. I'm coming here because Jesus works when we're together. And it's a cool thing. Okay, that's verse one. <laughs> One of the, uh, there is an outline uh, to each one of these letters, and it has, a, you know, they have a structure to them. There's seven letters to the seven churches, and seven is the number of what? Completeness. Completeness. Not the number of perfection. It's the number of completeness, because the dragon later on has seven heads, and the dragon is Satan in the book of Revelation. He's completely evil, Okay. So it's a number of completeness, not the number of, of perfection. Um, so there's seven letters to seven churches, which would mean you have a picture of the complete church, if you, wanna, if you wanna take that symbolism. And the structure has seven parts to it. And here's the structure, I'm just gonna lay it out for you. If you're taking notes, you can, you can write these down. Number one, there's a greeting, or, uh, a greeting and an address, it's an introduction. So number one is an int introduction. Number two, there's a description of Jesus or a title of Christ. The third thing that you're gonna see is a commendation where Jesus is saying good things about the church. The fourth thing you're gonna see is a condemnation where Jesus is saying bad things about the church. Fifth thing is an exhortation where he's telling them how to fix things. And the sixth thing is a call to hear. Let the, he who has ears, let, the, uh, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And number seven is there is a promise to the overcomer. There's a promise to the overcomer. Now, it's not like that with every single letter because like I already said, two of the letters don't have a condemnation. Jesus has nothing bad to say about two of the churches, which is gonna be cool because we'll look at those. A couple of the churches, he has nothing good to say about them, okay? And so, uh, but that's the, that's the basic structure that you have there. And in verse two here, you have the um, beginning of the commendation where Jesus is commending the church at Ephesus. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Um, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. And those are all awesome com commendations, aren't they? So Jesus goes through and he talks about the fact that these guys work and, the, and they labor and they have perseverance. Perseverance is just a term that means uh, basically stick to itiveness. It's the idea of you don't stop because there's opposition, you keep moving on. You don't stop because things get hard. You keep moving on. And it's a great word in Greek. Um, and that is one of the things that obviously as believers, we're supposed to have. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this, therefore my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. One of the things that happened to me when I first became a Christian was I um, ended up starting to get persecuted. I started getting hassled 
because I was following Jesus. And that, that has basically never stopped. It's never stopped. There's always been points where people have given me a hassle because I'm, I'm doing the things that God wants me to do. You cannot expect to follow God and not have hassles in your life. And that was one of the things that I had a real misconception about when I first became a Christian. When I first became a Christian, everything was roses and little butterflies and, and music in the background and stuff like that. And I was really happy to be a believer until the first time that somebody started hassling me. And when they started hassling me, I was like, what in the world is going on? I've completely changed my life. These people must know that I've completely changed. And you know, I was just shocked that the world wasn't standing up going, I thought that they should because I used to be one way and then Jesus changed me into another thing and they weren't all excited about the whole thing. I was, but they weren't. And I was like, what is going on with this? And after it, it took place for a couple of weeks, I started thinking, man, this is harder than being a non-Christian. When I was an unbeliever, even when I was rowdy and all the stuff that I was doing, when I was like that, I had all kinds of people who were around me who thought that I was awesome, who thought that it, this was, you know, I was a cool guy, I was the popular guy, all that kind of stuff. And I give my life to Jesus and all of a sudden everybody has a problem with me. What is going on here? And I literally was thinking, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up to get hassled by my friends. I didn't sign up to get, have people talk about me behind my back. I didn't sign up for all this garbage. I didn't sign up for this. What do I got to go through this for, God? I thought you were going to fix my life. What's going on here? And what I had, again, was a misconception. And I didn't have a misconception because nobody told me. I had a misconception because I wasn't listening. And what, what the pastor was telling me was, you know, following Jesus doesn't make you Mr. Popular. That following Jesus doesn't make people like you. Following Jesus makes Jesus like you. You become popular with heaven, not the world, with heaven. And Jesus said, if they hated me, what do you think that they're going to do to you? And if you get this idea that, that all of the world, including your family, my family did not applaud me that all the world should applaud you when you become a Christian. You get that idea in your head and it doesn't happen and you start getting an attitude and you start wondering about you know, what God's doing. And God's made this whole thing really clear. You need to follow me and there's reasons because it's the truth, because I'm God, because you owe me. I died for you because I love you. There's all kinds of awesome reasons to follow God and none of them have to do with your life is going to be rosy and peachy from this point on. That's coming when you get to heaven, that's coming. All of heaven will be applauding you. You will be Mr. Popular, Miss Popular up in heaven. Everybody's gonna like you. That's what's going to happen when you get to heaven. And that's gonna be for eternity. But right now, you can expect opposition. Opposition from your family, Jesus said. Opposition from the world, Jesus said. And obviously, you have an enemy of God who's going to oppose you. That would be the devil. He doesn't like it that you, be, that you became a Christian. And so you can expect to have hassles. You can expect to have opposition. So are you gonna to stick to it or not? And that was one of the points that Jesus made over and over with people. Are you going to stick to it or not? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There's coming a day when Jesus is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That day's coming and you're gonna hear it and it's gonna be good and it's all gonna be worth it. It'll be awesome but it might not be happening now. Paul said in, uh, in Timothy that if you want to, um, if you're going to walk in holiness, if you're gonna do the things that God wants you to do, then you have to expect persecution. All who wanna live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You have to expect it. And so when it, do, when it happens, don't get surprised. And so what you do is you just knuckle down, you keep following the Lord. Hebrews 3.14 says, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. I am a partaker of Christ if I hold the beginning of my confidence. That's when I first trusted in Christ. 
I first heard about him. I first realized that God loves me. I first realized that God wanted to forgive me and that God wanted, me, wanted to take me to heaven. And I had a confidence in him that that was all true. If I hold that confidence steadfast to the end, I'm a partaker of Christ, is what that passage says. And again, stick to itiveness. 2 Peter 3, 17 through 18 says, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. And so one of the ways that I can stay steadfast and keep from being led away from the, by the error of the wicked is that I grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I need to know more about Jesus. I need to keep following him. I need to get, get to know him better and better. And if I'm doing that, then I don't have to worry about this whole issue of steadfastness. Why would I ever leave Jesus? Why would I ever leave Jesus? Jesus is the only one who's been completely faithful to me. He's the only one. He's the only one who knows the absolute truth about me. He's the only one. He's the only one who knows me better than I know myself. He's the only one. And he's the only one who loves me despite the fact that I'm not what I should be. He's the only one. Everybody else has standards that they can't get past. Everybody else has things that are the final straw, right? And not Jesus. Why would I ever leave Jesus? Um, Lindsay um, has this little sign up in her office. She has signs all over her office. But she has this little sign uh, uh, up in her office that says, Jesus knows me, this I love. I thought that, I, I thought that was pretty cool the first time I saw it. Jesus knows me. This I love. Why would I ever leave Jesus? Right? Um, the second thing that you see in this passage is the fact that they have discernment. They have discernment. Um, I know your labor, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested them who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. There's a discernment there, and that's important. What I mean by discernment is the, the ability to tell truth from lies and the ability to tell good from evil. And it's important, an important thing to have as believers. Turn over to Acts chapter 20. I told you that we were going to go there. Acts chapter 20. And this is Paul talking to the elders at Ephesus. Um, right before he's going to go back to Jerusalem where he was going to be arrested and taken to Rome. Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 26. Actually, let's start in verse 25. He says, And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I've not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Whole counsel of God being, being the whole Bible. Um, when you're teaching the Bible, you're not supposed to be going through and teaching little bits and parts of it and, and that kind of thing so that you can shape it uh, to your own satisfaction. Um, that's one of the reasons that when we go through passages, we go through them verse by verse so that you can see before, you can see after, you can see what God has to say about things. And so Paul did that. I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And that's a Bible study in itself. But what, the, what Paul warned them about was the fact that wolves were going to come in. They were going to come in from the outside. They were going to come up from the inside and that they needed to be watching. Well, here we are 30 years later 
And they are doing exactly that. They're watching. And so Jesus commends them for the fact that they are discerning and they know a false teacher from a true one. They know a false apostle from a true apostle. They know um, whether or not somebody's good um, versus being evil by testing them. And the Bible says that we're supposed to test people. The Bible also teaches that we're not supposed to judge people. Don't judge anything before the time because you don't know everything that's going on. But at the same time, what you're supposed to be doing is testing people. And so I may not be somebody that can judge everybody's heart, but I can judge their fruit. I can look on the outside. And so basically when you look at the, the, at the issue of judgment in the church, what you're supposed to be looking at is fruit. Okay? So what's the fruit of a liar? Lies. What's the, fu- the fruit of a false prophet? False prophecies. You know, and you can go through and you can, you can look at, at um, uh, different issues that um, come up in people's lives and you can test the fruit. Jesus said, out of the abundance of your mouth, your heart speaks, right? And so you can test the heart of somebody by what's coming out of their mouth, right? And so it's stuff that we need to keep in mind. And Jesus said to do these things. There's a passage in 1 John chapter 4, verses one through three, it says this, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. And it's the idea of the spirit behind somebody's teaching. Whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you've heard was coming and is now already in the world. And so he says in that passage that one of the ways that you can test whether or not a guy is squared away or not is by what he says about Jesus. Did Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, really come? And that, that includes the whole idea of who Jesus is, and the Bible is specific on who Jesus is, who the Messiah is, and the fact that he actually came in the flesh. There were people that believed that Jesus didn't have a fleshly body, that he was never made of anything material, that he never really died on the cross because you can't kill a ghost, that kind of thing. And that was going going on at the time. And so that's one of those passages that speaks about testing. Here's another one. First Timothy chapter six, verses three through five. It says, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. You ever know anybody that was like that? Disputes and arguments over words from from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions. You ever seen anything like that? Useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. And then he says, from such withdraw yourself. So there are certain types of people that I'm to withdraw myself from because of their fruit, once again. And that again is something that the church at Ephesus was doing. Here's another one, Romans 16, 17 through 18. It says, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. I like that. You don't serve Jesus, you serve your belly. Um, For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. And so one of the things that I can know about a false teacher or somebody who's corrupt is that they're going to use smooth words and flattering speech. And so I'm not to be influenced by smooth words and flattering speech. What I'm supposed to be influenced by is the truth, right? It's always the truth. And that again is one of those things that you see at the church of the, of the church at Ephesus. Jesus in uh, John chapter seven, um, or excuse me, Matthew chapter seven, talked about false prophets and talked about the fruit of a false prophet. Why don't you turn over there real quick. Matthew chapter seven. And the whole, the whole chapter is awesome because it starts off with judge not that you be not judged, the unbeliever's favorite verse. 
Everybody knows that verse, right? <laughs> One verse that everybody on the planet has memorized. Um, but we're gonna start in verse 13. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So one of the things that you're gonna first see about any doctrinal issue is how you get to heaven and how many people are going. Is everybody going to heaven? Are most people going to heaven? It's not what Jesus said. He said it's a narrow way. And by the way, later on, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so one of the things you can, you can tell about a false prophet is if his false prophecies are teaching that most people are going to heaven, he doesn't agree with Jesus, right? And he goes on here and he says in verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. That's going to let you know that a false prophet is not gonna walk in, into the room dressed in black and a cape going Nyeh. He's not gonna do that. He's not gonna say, hi there, I'm a false prophet. He's not gonna have a little tag on his, on his chest that says, Joe you know, Finnegan, false prophet. Sorry if your name's Joe Finnegan, but that's not going to happen. He's going to be dressed in sheep's clothing. And so don't be deceived by it. There's all kinds of people who put on the dress of one of Jesus' sheep, but inwardly, he says in verse 15, they are ravenous wolves. One of the things that um, I've always done with, uh, well, not always done with people, but um, ever since I started teaching a home Bible study, um, there have been guys who have come in over the years and had agendas. And you know, you don't wanna just treat everybody who's new or anybody who has any kind of an agenda as a false prophet or as a wolf. I know some guys that go overboard on this whole thing. You know, if they're a wolf, what's going to happen is they're going to end up acting like a wolf and their teeth are gonna come out. At some point or another, their teeth are gonna come out. And so you don't have to treat them like a wolf when you first see them. As soon as their teeth come out, that's when you deal with the issue. You don't need to deal with it before, beforehand because there have been people that I thought were wolves that came to, actually came to Calvary when, uh, when we were um, smaller in my house. There was a guy who came and he was kind of weird. And I thought, man, this guy may have a real agenda. He may be a wolf and stuff. And I just sat back and watched the guy. You know, like three months later, he's all in love with Jesus and just going for it with the Lord. And a year later, he's on my board. And so, you know, you don't treat everybody like that because if they're really wolves and they're not teachable, then the teeth are gonna come out, but the teeth are going to come out. That's for all you home Bible study leaders. He says, verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. Um, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Do they? The answer is no, right? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. What is the fruit of a prophet? Prophecy. Is the fruit, fruit of a prophet tithing? No. Is the fruit of the prophet how many people are following him? No. Is the fruit of the prophet how long they've been around? No. What's the fruit of a prophet? Prophecy. And the reason I'm telling you that is because some false prophets go around, usually riding on bicycles with nice little name tags, and they come up to your door and what they'll say is, we're really good. We tithe and we have a church and there are people who are coming to it and we have family home evening. And you know, they'll do that kind of stuff. That's not the fruit of a prophet. The fruit of a prophet is their prophecy. And their prophecy is what they have to say about God, what they specifically predicted about the future, because they have. All, the, all these groups do that kind of stuff. And you check them out. And if they are false prophets, they are false prophets, no matter what the other stuff is, right? And then Jesus goes on and says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And I've even had some of these guys use that verse. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so we do the Father's will, and therefore we're okay. We'll look at the next verse. 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. Are those all good works? Yeah, and look at what Jesus says. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So your prophecies and your casting out of demons and all the wonders you've done are lawlessness because you don't know me. I don't know you. The will of the Father in heaven is that I know Jesus, that I have a personal relationship with him. And what Jesus is saying is that all your works mean nothing if you don't have the will of the Father in heaven, which is to know Christ. This is eternal life, they, Jesus said, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Let's do a whole works thing here. How many of you have ever prophesied? Raise your hands. Come on, some of you have. I've prophesied, okay? You've prophesied, so a few of you have prophesied. How many of you have never prophesied? Raise your hands. Oh, these guys are better than you. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, how many of you cast out demons? Raise your hands. And up until the time I went to India, I couldn't do this, but yes, okay. How many of you not, have not cast out demons? Raise your hands. Oh, these guys are better than you. How many of you have done wonders in Jesus' name? Raise your hands. And healing, let's do that. Prayed for somebody and they got healed. Okay, there's a wonder. How many of you have not? Oh, no, come on. You're either in or out. What is the deal here? <laughs> and again, the point is that if you're going by works, these guys are better than most of us. They're better than most of us. And yet Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. And that's again, one of those things that I say to the nice young men on the bicycles. You know, they say that the Lord's will is doing all this other stuff. And Jesus here says that his will is knowing him. The, all the other stuff follows and that's good, but the stuff without knowing Jesus is pointless. It's worse than pointless. Jesus says it's iniquity. You're, you're, you're working lawlessness without Christ. And so it's not what I do that gets me into heaven. It's who I know that gets me into heaven. Follow that? And so if you have a prophet that's teaching something else than that, something other than that, he's a false prophet. Wolf in sheep, sheep's clothing. And you need to be paying attention to that. And these guys have been doing that right well. Obviously, there's other issues with lifestyle. The Bible talks about the fact that the fruit of the Spirit needs to be exhibited in your life. And so that's love and joy and peace and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Against such, there is no law. And so you, you have this, this whole list of things that need to be exhibited in a believer's life. But when you're talking about a prophet, there are issues that you need to be paying attention to. In the early church, there were these guys who went around saying that they were apostles. Look again in, in Revelation chapter two, um, in verse two. And this is where I'm gonna end because I just ran out of time. It says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. We are to test people those who say they are apostles and are not. What year is this that this is being written? 90 AD, at the very least, it's 90 AD, okay? How many apostles are left? If you're talking about the 12, there's only one left, it's John. That's a pretty easy test. If all we're doing is talking about the 12, um, you're not John, therefore you're not an apostle. That would be a pretty easy test. Obviously, he's talking about something else. There were, there were a number of people that, were, that are called apostles in the Bible. Usually when we think of apostles, we think of the 12. The Barnabas, for example, was called an apostle. Paul the apostle is called an apostle. He's not one of the 12, according to 1 Corinthians 15. And so you have these guys who were called apostles and they were basically missionaries. They went around and started churches. And so when I think of the apostles, I think of the apostles, which are the 12, and the b-apostles, which are, the, <laughs> which are the other guys, the, the guys who are saying that they've been, the word apostle just means sent by God, sent by God and specifically to start churches. And what Jesus is saying here is that you know guys who've been sent from me 
to have this ministry. We would call them missionaries nowadays. You know these guys, you know who they are, and you've tested them to see whether or not they're really from me or not. And the reason that's important is because these guys would go around to churches and they would minister in places. They were kind of traveling um, teachers, tra traveling speakers. And so they come into town, want to teach at a church, and uh, they would uh, be dependent on the church's hospitality, going staying at people's houses and getting fed and, and that kind of thing. And a lot of guys were going around making money off the Christians um, because they were ripping people off. And so what Jesus is saying is you've tested these guys and you've found that they are liars. Jesus calls them liars. And so one of the things, again, that you gotta remember about the whole issue of discernment is that there are people who are not nice and they tell lies. And we need to be aware of those things and be paying attention to that, right? And so we're not in a situation where inside the church, it's all hunky-dory and everything's fine and everybody's always gonna be nice and they're always gonna be doing the things that God wants them to do. It's not the case. This is the place where Jesus is being glorified, where Jesus is being magnified in people's lives, where people are coming to know, know Christ. That's what the church is, right? Do you expect that Satan might attack that? Okay, so you're not to be unaware of those things. You need to understand that there are times when the church is going to be under attack, especially when things are happening and things are growing and stuff like that's going on. Um, you never hear about um, churches that are dead being attacked by Satan. He doesn't need to. But churches that are living and growing, they get attacked, right? It's the same thing with individuals. If I am sitting around and I'm messing with the world, I am not getting attacked by the devil. I may be being sucked in by the world, but the devil's not going to attack that. He appreciates that. If you want hell to applaud you, ditch Jesus, go back to partying, and the devil will clap for you. He's not going to attack you at that point. But if you're going to do the things that God calls you to do, and you're gonna live for Jesus, you need to expect that you're going to be attacked once again. Okay? And so, um, again, you have to understand that. So there's a discernment that needs to be taken place. Um, let, me, let me do one last thing because this is one of those areas that I see most often where believers get attacked, especially younger believers, especially young women believers, not just women, but young men believers too, but young women believers. The guy of your dreams comes along. He's tall, he's dark or blonde, whichever one you prefer. He's handsome. He has blue eyes or brown eyes, which one, whichever one you prefer. They're dreamy. He's the nicest guy that you have ever met. He's nicer than all the Christian guys that you know. He just doesn't happen to know Jesus. Might that be an attack? Do you think Satan's stupid? What he's gonna do is bring along some guy that's going to draw you away from Christ and he's walking, and walking in again, once again, with a black cape some black hat going, -eh -eh. I want to wreck your life, cause you to turn away from Christ. Is he going to do that? No, he's not going to do that. And you know, if I was Satan, I'd be, I'd be getting the, your dream boat. Find your dream boat, whisper in his ear, go check this chick out. Get, get him to come and talk to you and pay attention to you and be nice to you and turn you away from Christ. That's what I would do if I was a devil. I'd be a great devil, right? And the same thing the other way, guys. She's, you know, whatever your vision is of an angel, she's this vision of an angel, she's wonderful, she's nicer than all the Christian girls that I know, and you know, the only problem is that she doesn't know Jesus, and I'll change her. Actually, guys, guys don't go that way as often as girls do. I'll change him, I'll bring him to church. If he tries to kiss me, I'll stick a Bible in his mouth. You know, that, that kind of thing. And again, you have to understand that if you're growing and you're following Christ and you're doing the things that God wants you to do, you are going to be under attack. Satan is not going to leave it the status quo. He's gonna to try to wreck things. And so you have to be paying attention. And again, Jesus commends this. And a lot of times um, when I've heard people teach this passage, they just kind of go over the, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, kind of go over that and get to the end of it. We're gonna get to the end of it, not today, but later, but get to the end of it and just ignore all that stuff. That's not to be ignored, that's a commendation from Christ. And if those things are going on in your life, that's good. 
That's awesome. And if they're not, you need to get a clue because you're going to get creamed. You're going to get creamed. Satan does not fight fair and he wants to wipe you out. So we'll end it with that and uh, pick it up next week. And uh, maybe we'll get through it actually. Let's, let's pray. Father, I just, again, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, um, Father, for the, the fact that you, um, you teach us things that we need to know through your word. And you've been doing it for thousands of years. Those things were written in 90 AD, like we've been talking about, and they're just so applicable to everything that we go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to be, um, like Jesus says in this passage, people who have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Um, Lord, we won't always want to have our ears open to the things of you. And so, God, we just uh, pray that you continue to speak to us this week and that you'd work in our hearts and help us to follow you with, uh, um, just with, with an awesome attitude. We want to be people who persevere. We want to be, be people who stick to it with you. And we ask that you do all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.